Okay, I think we can start. So, uh, welcome everyone to Ruby Tuesday and JavaScript Penang, meetup number 11. So, uh, to, probably brought to you by uh, Ruby KL Group, um, JavaScript Malaysia. So, there's a meetup link here, uh, Ruby Malaysia. You can get yourself as a member so that you can check out our event, uh, our monthly event in KL and Penang. So, Wi Fi. So, this is the Wi Fi username and password you need to log in. Um, each username and password only allows two to three users only. And they only valid for this event. After this event, they won't be valid anymore. So, time to put in. That's good. Okay, so next, um, so ACAT sponsored the venue. It's been um, a venue sponsor for many, many months. So um, I'm Gui, um, I'm a software developer um, for uh, Functionize and I am based in Penang. So any uh, wish of you are the first time attending this meetup? Might introduce yourself to the crowd. Yeah, sure. I'm Ron. It's nice to have all kinds of content in the world. As a real native developer, I work at two company groups. And so is Ron. And he's from Morocco. Yeah. Uh, my name is Terry. No, I'm from Chile, not to speak. I'm a Chinese uh, Australian developer. Nice. So let's get started. So today, this uh, is uh, these are our talks today. Intro to Rails Engine and JavaScript. In fact, we have component-based architecture and intro to Gatsby. So let's start with Kyle uh, with JS. This one should be HTML. HTML or mini. I don't know. I Okay, hello everyone. So who, it seems like most people are a JavaScript developer, right? <laughs> Does anyone want a review person? It's okay. One room? Yeah. <laughs> because the, I'll, I'll explain it in such a way that if you're a JavaScript person, you can understand it fine and you can even do it yourself. So I think you can, um, I'll try to explain it in such a way that you can still get the value out of what I'm talking about. So I'm going to be talking about uh, Ruby on Rails topic, and in particular Rails engines. So the thing that I was thinking about with, when I was um, working on this topic was about going to the dentist and what is the worst thing that you can think about when you have to go to the dentist again. What's the worst thing about going back to the dentist? Okay. What's that? Okay. The, yes, I agree, that's one bad thing. Pitching. But is, isn't there something worse? Getting hurt. Hmm? Getting hurt. Getting hurt, yes, but getting hurt, for me, getting hurt emotionally. It's not the physical pain that I am worried about. It's that the dentist, his or her attitude, it's like, trying to guilt me that I didn't take good enough care of my teeth. Like, oh, you should know better. You didn't floss like I told you to last time, right? It's this kind of um, guilting that, that I fear the worst. So I have two confessions actually related to this. Um, number one is that I didn't always used to floss my teeth. So it was my own fault actually when I would go to the dentist and I knew better. Um, and the, but now I've begun to do it and the dentist is now a lot better. The dentist visit and also i didn't used to use rails engines and but now i've started to do so and i i know that i should do so 
Um, so what is Rails Engines all about? Um, basically, it's like a cute mini app inside your real app. And it helps you to encapsulate your solution to whatever problem is that you're working on. Um, so it doesn't interfere with the rest of your real app. And um, you might ask, what's the difference between a Rails engine and a Rails gem? Um, a Rails engine is um, rail, uh, Rails oriented, whereas um, a gem is can be pure Ruby. So it may not be purely Rails um, oriented. So why should I care if you're Ruby dev? Um, I'll suggest to you ways that, that um, you can work on a big app without um, kind of dependencies leaking into one another and, and coupling things together when they don't need to be. Um, but for all the JavaScript people, um, in the course of explaining this, I think that the, the most illustrative way to explain what I'm talking about is to do it really step by step and talk about the core of what a really simple main app is really trying to achieve. So in the course of doing this, I'll explain it in such a way that you can even do it yourself, and I, I promise you'll be able to understand. So if it, it's not making sense, please interrupt me as we go along. So why Rails engines? Um, when you, so if any of you have, uh, or have had a significant other or romantic partner, like do you think that it's a good idea or a bad idea for that partner to be good friends with your other good friends? Good idea or bad idea? Important that it's a good idea or bad idea? Good idea. Good idea? Okay. Um, <laughs> it can work, I guess. But my own perspective is that it's all of these things. Like, um, if it, your significant other is not good friends with your other friends, then you can really encapsulate the, the parts of your life. Like, you can have this um, romantic partner part of your life, and then you can enjoy with your friends whatever you would normally enjoy. Um, and your life can, so there are many examples of a life that can work quite well when you keep these two parts of your life separate. And also, it's a, I would argue that it's an easy way to live your life. Um, but I would suspect that there are things that you, or stories that your friends could tell that maybe you would not want your partner to know. So I think that it's um, an easy way to keep these things separate. And I think the same is kind of true with Rails engines. Um, it really gives you a discipline when you're um, coding an app and allows you to keep things separate quite, quite more easily than if everything is part of one big monolith. Um, it works. Down here I put a um, link to an app that's entirely, it's a monolith that's entirely composed of different Rails engines. You can build an entire working app just from Rails engines. And also it's not difficult because if I can do it, I promise you can also do it. So let's look at one example. And um, I would invite anyone to take out their phone first. And um, to, so for this app, I invite you to take a photo of our organizer here. And that. <laughs> so many. And the app is, it's a simple app that allows us to put photos of him and then to put a caption. So I've done a sample here. Um, and let me see if I can find another photo to illustrate. This one? <laughs> so many. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, and by the way, so the, the URL to this app is um, this skirt. So you can um, try on your own as well to upload a photo. Um, so I'll just quickly illustrate what it can do. Upload a new photo. Sorry, the cord is like quite sensitive. Choose my photo. Create the photo. So this is, sorry, I haven't put any um, styling on it. So what, what I can do when I have my photo uploaded is I can then caption it. Okay, so 
factual analysis. Okay, so let's talk about how this works and why it might be a good idea to do it with a Rails engine. So, but first, I'm having a problem in my own life that I want to talk about. Um, does anyone think they could tell me why is this phone not able to turn on? Is anyone good with phones? I know Albert is quite good in working with phones. Do you have any idea why it might be this phone can't turn on? It's very dangerous. Okay. So, what idea? What might be your problem? Battery? Okay. How would you How would you investigate about that? Yeah. How, like, you think it's the battery? What might be your next step? Okay. So, so in the moment, though, can you think of anything you can you can try? Yeah, try it, try it, try it. <laughs> <laughs> so, is the is there's no proper battery inside? Mm -hmm. um, so when we're trying to understand the problem, the first thing we did was we looked at the behavior of the thing. Um, it couldn't turn on, that was the behavior. And then we tried to take it apart and see what are the different component parts um, and what might be the problem. And finally, um, let's talk about the, the problem at hand. Um, if there's no battery in it, do you think that if we put in a battery that the phone itself might work? Um, it's at least worth a try, right? Yeah. So then the last thing we would do is talk about which parts are related to one another, are there any dependencies on, on uh, one another. So I suggest that we do the same thing with the app that we just talked about. Um, talk about a structure, what it's trying to achieve. Um, and I know that might be a tedious thing to do, um, look at how to make a very boring CRUD app, but I would suggest to you that actually it's uh, a worthwhile endeavor. And I'll tell you a quick story about that. Um, there's um, near our office at Victochart, there's one McDonald's. And um, the peculiar thing about this uh, McDonald's is like there's a um, section of the wall that's a mirror. And so if you ever have found yourself in a McDonald's um, and there's perfectly good food elsewhere, but you see yourself in the mirror eating McDonald's, you'll come to question, why did I come to this point in my life? Why do I make these kinds of choices? And I think it's, it's um, making a bad choice is not something that you, you didn't intend to end up there. You didn't intend to write bad code that's all coupled together that can't be changed anymore. Um, so I think we have to look at sometimes the minutia and the tedious choices. Why did we come to this point? And so I think it's worth looking at these um, kind of quickly going through these boring parts of how do we make this um, basic app um, in order to understand why it might be a good idea to use something like a Rails engine. So just very quickly, when I made this app, <clears throat> I used um, uh, Rails New to create a new app, and I added. Um, a dependency called RSpec to help us do testing. And this creates, a, this creates for us a app's a skeleton, so it's um, kind of Rails opinionated way of how the app itself ought to be structured. So uh, for any um, non-Rails person, please, please stop me if there's any question as I go along. So uh, my question to you is the app we just looked at, the app that I, ge that I generated with Rails new, um, what's kind of the characteristics of the app? Is there any particular design pattern? Is there, um, what, what might be the resource? What can it do? Like, what did you observe about the app that I quickly showed you? Yeah, the amount of functionality is the uh, loading photos. Yes, a couple of photos. You have main, um, main functionality is just a couple of photos. Does anyone know about Rails? What's the um, kind of overlying design pattern? It's a, uh, yeah, it's an MVC app, yep, you're right. Um, so what we created there is an MVC app that's a resourceful app, so it's dealing with um, CRUD actions for a particular resource. And this resource is, in this case, it's a, like, you can call it GUI photo. So really the heart of the app is this one particular resource. Um, 
And then what I did was I um, generated a scaffold for the resource, um, so you can, uh, uh, so if you're following along, you can see the, the commit there. Um, and we talked about what does this do? What, so what does this app know about? Yeah, it knows about um, very minimal things, like what, what is the picture and what, um, what uh, action are you doing with the photo? Are you adding it or destroying it? Um, so no, it needs to know very little, actually. Um, so then the other chore, it's a little bit outside the scope of what I'm talking about, uh, but the commits are here, is I added some kind of configuration to store the stuff on S3, to store the photo. Um, so now we have a problem. We have the existing app that we talk, we agreed. It's basically just a CRUD app for uploading the photo and destroying the photo, um, naming the photo. That's, that's all it does. But now we want to add some functionality for captioning the photo. So where does this captioning functionality fit within the structure of the basic CRUD app? Or does it fit? I, I would argue that it's not a proper CRUD action for any for the resource, and it's not itself its own resource. It can be. It can be. So, it, like the one instinct would be to put it in the controller, and I would argue that what comes closest is to put it in the update, the edit in the update for the photo. Um, but suppose that we want to do like proper legitimate editing of the photo, like resize it or. Um, profit or something that I would argue in this case that captioning is something separate and it's not really the same as editing. So in my view, it, it represents something that's not really a, a part of the main app itself. So when you have a problem with your um, wrist or something and you go to the doctor, does he or she ask you, why do you want to get strength in your wrist? Like you're playing tennis or you're playing hockey or what? Does the doctor well, I don't know, I never go to the doctor. Does the doctor ask, ask this? I think no, I think the doctor just focuses on the problem at hand, and you talk about what you're trying to strengthen your wrist or whatever with your friends or whomever. So you focus on, on what you're trying to achieve, and I think that this is another case of that. The main app just focuses on the its responsibilities of the, the CRUD app with the photos, and I would argue that the captioner can be something completely separate. It could, in fact, be a Rails engine. It need not know about anything about the, or very little about the main app. Um, so when we make the decision to add an engine to the main app, uh, we have a choice. It can be a mountable engine or a full engine. And as I understand it, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, a, a mountable engine is the kind of engine that um, has its own namespace, its own um, namespace routes, controllers, models. And it does not you know, directly share um, models or a namespace with the main app. Whereas the full app, uh, it does share all these things with the main app. So um, we would create a mountable engine like this and a full engine like this. And um, so when I run this command to make a full, uh, or sorry, to make a mountable engine, it generates for me this skeleton that's a little bit difficult to see with this lighting, but. Um, does this, um, well, does anyone have any observation about what's generated when I um, make this? Uh, Rails app. Yeah, it's a, the, so this is the engine, but it's exactly the same structure as a Rails app. So it's like a mini app inside. Yeah, so, um, so the, the next challenge is that we, the, um, the engine needs to have access to the photos, but we, would, we talked about we would prefer for it not to have to know anything about the main app. So how do we let it access the photos without knowing about the main app? We use some kind of abstraction. So um, here I've just um, kind of <clears throat> in some initializers, I've configured what do we call the, how do we refer to the photo class, and notice that the uh, photo class, it could change. Um, we don't even know, need to know within the, uh, within the engine what this is pointing to. It could change over time. And I don't need to know anything about it at all. And this represents kind of an abstraction or a contract that allows my, um, my engine to work with an app 
uh, model from the main class. And um, in Ruby, what does anyone have an idea of what would be a good basis for a contract, or what? How, how do you think of a contract between different modules or parts of a code in, in Ruby or in any language? Like the okay, the, the way that I think about it is, and this is in terms of duct typing. So I, I represent the contract in a very simple way. I, I put in the engine a small test to say that whatever I call my, um, what are we calling it? Image class, whatever I call my image class from the main app, it just needs to be something that can give me a it response to picture. Um, if I call picture, it gives me back a picture. And that's all that I need to know about it. So I've just written this very simple test in the, um, in the engine. Um, so the other thing to keep in mind um, when setting up an engine is that it, an engine has its own dependencies, and I specify those in the job spec for my particular engine. So in this case, I've set up the testing suite R spec, and I've also used a tool that, that allows me to caption the photos. Um, the other thing I did, so um, what we've created is actually a gem itself. So we need to include that gem in the main app, and then mount the app in the uh, routes of the, of the main app, so I, I do it like this. So then the last thing I want to talk about is there, in, in my view, there are really only a couple of difficult things about setting up a, 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 a engine uh, in a main app. And one of those is testing, um, attempting to test like purely in the abstract. So uh, without any reference to something like the conditions that would normally be used in, in, the, in the main app, I would argue that can be a bit tricky. Um, so something like when we test a, a concern in Rails, um, we can kind of simulate a little bit of the real world conditions in which we would actually be using the, the um, the engine, and you can do that in a um, when you generate an engine and the, the testing suite for it, there will be a dummy app inside the, the spec directory, and then you can specify within the dummy app some classes that would be in your um, in your main app. So in this case, I I think I put that GUI photo was um, uh, a model in the dummy app. You can see more details here, and then the Last thing that I think is only a little bit difficult is working with associations between between resources, um, particularly when there's um, a resource that's related to that's associated with um, that there's an engine resource associated with a main app resource. Um, the challenge is that the main app probably should not need to know or to specify this association. So one solution that I like is, is talked about in detail here, but just briefly, is to in the initialization of the um, of the engine, you can spend you can um, kind of use class eval and open up the the main app um, class or model, and then specify what the association is in the uh, the engine itself. So the the main app doesn't need to know about the um, or the association doesn't need to be specified in the in the main app. So if you remove the whole um, engine, then everything's still okay. Um, so just to close, like I promise that if you ever find yourself doing Ruby on Rails, um, if you set up an engine, it's not particularly hard, I promise. Um, there's also no excuses for not doing it in a larger app. It's um, something like classing. And then once you create one, then I promise that you want to create more as well. So then um, for any of the notes or the kind of commit messages, you can, you can visit here. Okay, any question? So device is also a real engine. Yes, you're so right. is it a partial or a full engine? Or uh, I believe it's a multiple engine, but I haven't looked into device so much. Because we can override some of the device functions. That's true, yeah. So it means that um, the engine will interfere with the main app because you are overriding some of the stuff. Um, and yeah. expose some of the model. Um, I know it's set up in such a way that we can kind of configure it in the main app. Um, but I'm afraid I don't know the answer to your question whether it's a um, full app or a, a full engine or a multiple engine because I haven't looked into the source of the device. Mm -hmm.
it's one of those things probably we should look into that we're using every day, but I, I never have looked into it. Okay. Uh, maybe, maybe I don't know It's uh, something along the lines called microservices. It's microservices in my view, it's one of these like clusters that can do a lot of things. I think it's, in my view, it's um, something along the same line. It's trying to abstract out a lot of things, encapsulate it, and I think it's um, in the same sphere as this. So that's my point. Is that the solution? All right, so the Rails engine is the sub. It's a, basically a sub that we have to make that here. Yeah. And you deploy that together. So um, typically that is the case, although, like we was saying with um, with device, is a famous um, gem. Um, the engine can be uploaded to like the gems repository, and it can be um, deployed separately. Um, but in most cases, as I understand it, it's not to deploy. Sorry, what was a confusing answer? But I, uh, short answer: I think it can be either one. Um, it can be deployed separately, or so basically you can. Um, now, after the fact that you want to scale the That I, the dependency um, image magic, um, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I it just use this to, to modify the um, image itself. If you take the engine out uh, as a separate app, how would your main end now communicate with the engine? So you would, um, you would get the dependency in the gem file for the main app, and then you could do a piece of fun. So I would specify yeah. the. So um, you install it like a gem. It installs like a gem, and then um, it depends. Like you would, so um, I talk here about how you can kind of um, set up some initializers to cleanly specify how the different parts, how the main app will talk to the um, engine. So you can do something like this. Um, so in the case of Devise, which I would think is the most well-known engine, like there are particular initializers that you can configure and set up. Why would you start with an engine over a gem? Um, a gem is something that, as I understand it, um, I want to deploy that other people might use in their various apps. Um, so in this case, I set up an engine for just for this particular app. So if I thought that someone else might be able to use it, I maybe would deploy it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker. Okay. Yeah. something with Lego. So uh, I would like to just uh, run through a bit of what we are going to talk today. Uh, first, I will just introduce the CBA, what is the component-based architecture. 
And then uh, I would also like to share uh, something that uh, we as a uh, team did uh, to migrate from the native uh, JavaScript into the CPA architecture. And then uh, our takeaway and challenges. Okay, so uh, what is a component? So uh, it's by by terms, it's an independent piece of software that is reusable and composable to make a meaningful application. So in in a sense that if we look at this, so what what should we call it? If you like to, to name it, it's a house. Okay. So but uh, let's see. Uh, how how do you determine it as a house? Yeah. So basically, because there is like a piece of combination, then you would like to call it a house, right? But if let's say that we tear it up, it will just become just a simple block. Something that you can reuse again for other purposes. Let's say you want to build a bridge or anything. So yeah, basically it's as a component base, you build a kind of a small pieces that is uh, something reusable and then when it's combined together, it becomes something more meaningful. Okay, so in thinking of a component, there is some certain uh, principles that uh, we can follow. So first, uh, it has to be independent, so able to be used on their own without any cross dependency with other components. So it's like a Lego pieces, like let's say this one, uh, we call it a pixel button, because in a component wise, you might also put like some specific naming for your blocks. Like in Lego, like there is a long one, there is a short one, and you can build one for it. But let's say for this button, we can call it pixel button. Then, uh, yeah, basically, like the button can tell each other, I can go anywhere I want. I can also, uh, I don't need any others to follow me. It means that I don't need uh, any any other components to make me as a button. Like I'm a I'm a button by myself. Okay. So the second thing is that it's clearly defined. So when we try to make it as a component, we have to make it also as generic as possible. So let's say that we are trying to build an application and then we try to see in our design, okay, this button is meant for saving. It doesn't mean that we have to make a button that we can call it picto save button. Because when we try to put a specific name for it and then we try to make use of, make use of this similar design to other purpose, let's say for search button or anything, then you might find it confusing, like why this button name doesn't match with the usage. So make it as clear, uh, clearly as possible. And then uh, encapsulated, it also means that uh, it has its own functionality. So when it has its functionality, it it's mostly has its own rules. Like when it's a button, you create a button, you can also tell, okay, this button, I will only give him a specific method to uh, modify. For example, I will I will give him an uh, option so that I can change the color, I can change the size. And it's also better for design consistency that for the size you can also put a proper name instead of just like giving a number of sizes. So then when we want to make everything small, we know that there is a consistent uh, size for small, medium and large. Something around the way what it looks. Okay, so uh, it's also meant to be reusable. That because now we know that it's already a generic button, so we know that we can make use of this button for different purposes, for a saving button and for insert button everywhere. Like it's reusable. Okay, uh, so just about the uh, principle again. Yeah. So everything about if let's say you have a design. You have like a mock-up of the design that you want to build a website. You can think of every single pieces as a component. It's again actually it's based on how we mind map the design. And then uh, apart from having a, if let's say we have everything is already uh, call it architecture, then we need to put a mind that there is a relationship around this uh, one uh, one. Architecture. Let's say it's a house. Just now we, we know that in the Lego there is a house, right? So let's we can say that in a house there is a multiple component. That that means that there is another component. Let's say a parent, which we call the parent is a house component. Inside the house component, 
there will be a button uh, search input element a window anything so that's that's the meaning of when there is a parent and child relationship a house is a parent and those uh, small components that we want to make use is basically the child so uh, when when we create a component it also can define its own life cycle so uh, i will make uh, explain the life cycle more detailed so so uh, I would like to show you uh, some part of our application. So this is our current editor. So uh, I would like to uh, know some thoughts. So let's say you see this application. Let's say, let's say this is coming from the designer. And then now we as a developer, we would like to build it. So can you give uh, some inputs? Where, which part that you would like to componentize and what is the name of the and see that the side bar is a container. This one? The whole side bar. Oh, the whole side bar. Yeah, it's a container. Yeah. And then it has many components inside. For example, the input brings the bottom, the account, the tabs, the side tabs. Sure. So let's say if this is a, a one big uh, one component, what would you like to call it? Uh, it is a container. A container? Yeah. All right, cool. Okay, uh, is there and how about the other parts anyone? You like to let's say this header, is it worth to become a component of its own? Yeah, it's working. How about the uh, this part? So actually yeah, we I mean in even in my team sometimes we have a difference of, I would like to know what would you call this part if you're gonna name the component. Sorry? Editor. Lead? Editor. Editor. This is the editor. Yeah, uh, makes sense. Anyone else want to give some name for it? You know the Two Toolbar. Yeah. So yeah, you can also call it to by like a set of tools. So yeah, basically a naming, it could be something that uh, different from, from the different mindset of different experience, right? But again, Basically, the name should be something that will help you to define the purpose of it. And then in here, so let's say that this is the, the part where it visualizes your uh, data or like your uh, visual. What, what would you like to call this part? Canvas. Oh, sorry? Canvas. Canvas. Nice. Yeah. Nice name. Okay. So. Uh, this is from from our side, so we you see we would like to call this part is the editor header, and then uh, the red one, yeah, we call it toolbar. This part we call it a uh, side pane assets because it's kind of it's a side pane that uh, holds the asset library, and then in here we call it canvas. So. Uh, in a relationship between the component, uh, again there is a parent and child relationship. So I would like to highlight more. Since that just now we see there is a big application, we also know that we try to separate them by by the terms like that: the editor, part, uh, the header part, the sidebar part, the canvas part. So that means we we need like a certain uh, relationship that can make them communicate each other. So by having a communication, that means if we see the big page just now as the editor page, those are the child. So having a child, basically it means that they, they are like a siblings. So when, when it's a siblings, uh, it's, a, it's a rule that uh, it's best to avoid. It actually doesn't mean that it's not impossible. Sorry. It doesn't mean that it's impossible. No, I mean it's actually possible to have a communication but it's highly recommended to avoid because uh, may imagine like being a okay it's maybe not a necessary term for parenting but it's good that if the parent can help to define what the child uh, should do so the child does not have its own communication then actually the parent might miss out and then you might have some uh, unexpected side effects okay uh, so this is about the life cycle that I have found. So in the component base, basically when, when we have this one component, let's say we call just now is the canvas part, there is always a life cycle on every component. 
the life cycle sometimes we can determine a specific uh, logic for it. So let's say in the canvas, there is a life cycle that we want to uh, make use. Of. When it first initialized, when we first render, we want to load the data, and then we want, when we get the data, we want to render them. Because uh, if we only load it without any data, then it becomes meaningless. So we can put the code about the initialization in here, basically in the part where it first loaded up. And then in the rendering part, is usually where, let's say we have a logic that comes from outside, that I want to add items, I want to remove the item to a specific part. The, the canvas will always have the state or the data that it watch, and whenever the data changes, it will re-render to make use of the changes. And then when it's about the destroying, let's say that we want to move to the other page. You so this part sometimes it's not necessary, but sometimes it's also meaningful for removing some certain events. Yeah, you're right. So basically, these are like the life cycle of our components. Okay, so uh, just now it's the introduction about the components. So uh, okay, I think before this maybe you can ask anyone wanna. Ask some questions about components before we. What do you think about the React Hooks part to to match that? React Hooks, yeah. oh, the React Hooks, the, the new, I mean, it's the new CPI for React. Right? I honestly haven't really used of it, but from the one that I read, it seems like it's more about uh, creating the. I call it like creating the state uh, from I mean from the component without really having to create a, uh, like a call in this way. like we can I don't know like from what I see I may not really understand much. Yes, they they broke all the properties of the lifecycle of the component. Component did mount, will mount, will be mount, etc. Into one function. The user. Uh, so, what do you think about that approach compared to the current approach? To the, to the traditional approach. Yeah. Hmm. I think if, if I, from what I read about the hooks, is meant mostly for the uh, functionality to be able to be uh, pulled outside from the component so that we can test it. But yeah, I haven't actually expressed it myself, so I can't really. Part of that child only. Ah, uh, yeah. It's like something you have like a. Uh, for example, you want to draw the label and then you put like a maybe your label is on that and the object is on that. Like maybe next time if your another one, uh, your code or input component will be that and then the label is right. So are you going to create another component for uh, for this or you know, can you understand what? Uh, so if, basically, the if I understand it, like the input and label is a separated component, oh, right? Like it, yeah, if it's a separated component, right, basically it's a base of a compositions. Us usually, when it comes to a standard, then we would like to create another component that is composing this uh, certain standard. Right? Let's say that a combination for the input and a label is meant for a standard form input. That let's say uh, the standard is that the name of the uh, input, like the email, is a label, and then we put it right on the input. So then we make a component of this, and then we will reuse it everywhere. Like it's become a standard. But again, that to me, uh, it it should be based on the designer standard. Like usually we will register it as a design system. But if you familiar with the terms, because yeah, it's become more like a, uh, what do you call it, like a pattern. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anyone? Uh, let me 
to continue. So uh, I would like to share the, a bit of our history. So uh, in when I joined in 2014, when I joined in the first time, I I uh, joined the JavaScript team, and then we I foresee like uh, the JavaScript is mostly actually is like a native approach. Basically, native means that there is not much of a structure there. It's like every page has its own JavaScript. Another page has its own JavaScript. There is sometimes a share uh, share codes, but that share codes is also something that is specific to these different pages. So uh, I mean, we, uh, when I join and when we try to tidy up a bit, we also try to make it as like a MVC structure. MVC might not really make sense for a JavaScript term, but the, the base of the MVC that uh, is defined here is that controller is about the page. Like let's say in the editor page, all the logic about the page is in the controller. The model is more about like the data management. Like if we want to store a specific shared data that we want to use, let's say we add, it, add items, remove items, we put it in the model. And then the view is usually when we want to do something specific to the job. Let's say like show button, hide button, and then we put that kind of function in the view. Uh, and then the HTML templates, back then we, we also like rely on the backend. So the backend will provide the whole HTML included with the data that is uh, fetched from the from the Rails, uh, I mean sorry, from the controller or from the model. And then after that, yeah, we will just manipulate the data in the JavaScript inside. And then yeah, we use jQuery to modify them. So the cities are our Past, uh, uh, past uh, approach. So, if you can imagine the code, it's something that is specifically like this. Uh, let's say when we have a canvas and then when we want to add an item, then we will point that canvas and then append a specific uh, another element inside it. Then when we want to remove an item, then we will also point to the canvas. Then we will uh, specifically find the ID of the item. And then so it's very straightforward, like cutting through the, the DOM to make the modifications. So uh, yeah, I mean, it's a big headache when it comes to having a new feature or having like uh, people to, to add a modification or improvement. So because of the inconsistent templating, some created by the JavaScript, like that div, uh, the div script that we see, that, that one is in the JavaScript, but the template is in HTML. And then we also need to manually write function script to update the view whenever we add or we remove. So CSS code itself is also that time we kind of like put it in uh, one place, but then that CSS is uh, being loaded, like we just load it to be reused as we are, even though we are not actually using it. So we are moving the CDA to utilize the reactivity concept of view templating and the application state. So then we also standardize our templating that is fully rendered by the front end. That means the back end actually is still there, but the back end is just to serve a base uh, template. Like it's mostly just the static HTML part. So uh, the approach that we use, uh, if you, I think in here we can, we know there is a lot of, uh, some framework that is kind of approach this view, I mean this uh, approach of framework. Mostly React because React is, uh, I think, is the most popular one and the most, uh, uh, I mean, the one that has a, a lot of community and the support to use. Uh, so for us, we, we decided to use uh, Vue. So I uh, would like to share uh, the reason. So uh, the the reason that we support, uh, that we choose Vue is that we we like to uh, make use of the HTML templating. So JSX is uh, a way to make use of the templating in. Uh, React, uh, but it's something that it might also need the onboarding, especially for the UI developer or the team that is not really familiar with JavaScript. That they need to understand the term of the JSX and some there is some of the limitation that uh, I mean it's a differences in the uh, real HTML and the JSX. So by using Vue, we can make use of the HTML templating and uh, the CSS is modular as well because it has some capabilities to support a style by uh, So uh, there is also like the official ecosystem that is already provided by Vue, but again this is something that I think you also see in React as well because from the terms that you see I read from the view actually they also uh, what you call it, they adapt from React. 
So the CLI, the doctor, the QX for the data management, and then the gas utilities. So it's also about like the trends that when we move, that time was 2017, and but we, when we see the trends, uh, view is some some is a framework that is quite rising high in the terms of the popularity and the uh, adaptation. Even though it's still like compared to React and compared to Angular at that time, but uh, when we when we see the, the state, we also see the Angular is being stagnant. Yeah. So uh, what's changed? So from here, I mean, we can see that. Uh, from the previous code that uh, we see, the changes that we do mostly is about uh, respecting the data, like respecting a state as a central data that we use to render our application. So in here, instead of when we add item, instead of manipulating the DOM directly, we, we don't have to manipulate the DOM because we already have the, react, the templating for that. And then we just have to manipulate the data when we want to add or remove the item. So uh, it's also about like how we try to uh, think differently when we are creating a new uh, new elements or new components that we try to uh, make them as generic as possible, as reusable as possible, and then we also like make a different terms of it because I think in view basically when we try to make it as a component, we will try to think of this as like let's say we call this as the upload to drop area. And then when let's say this design is something that is likely to be reused on let's say different pages, then we, uh, those design the designer can agree to hey let's keep reusing this thing as for our other pages. And then this one for the upload quota. So maybe sometimes you you will pick this kind of component, but actually it's gonna be only used in here. But in my opinion, that is still okay because when we creating a component, we are not only creating. I mean, we are not only just like putting a name and then grouping it, but it's also to put a code of separation of the code. It's more like we know that this in here we might gonna have some calculation needed for uh, knowing the quota or etc. So we know that when someone wants to look at this code and try to find it out, they know that it's definitely somewhere around in this code. Like it shouldn't exploit in other places. So it's also about the changes of the mindset. So previously, HTML has its own folder, JavaScript has its own folder, CSS has its own folder. Now everything is more about combination that based on that component, they, it's become an SFC, like we call it single file component, where the HTML, the JavaScript, and the CSS are loaded in there. So uh, our takeaway when we are doing that is that uh, the consideration when we are doing this is first it's because we are trying to build a large scale app where we know that we need to keep uh, reinventing new things we need to keep having new people to join and then he, he can specifically focus on that specific area so uh, it's meant for the large app but uh, i think this is something that is debatable because again it's based on the needed the necessity of the application that you would like to build Sometimes if it's just a landing page, maybe it's a bit over use that you want to use uh, those kind of uh, library of components. And then it's also meant for the long term because we know that having this component types or uh, 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 structure is because we want to keep using it or we want to keep maintaining it or improving it for long term. And then it's also it's something that uh, meant for teams, like not only uh, one one developer. So uh, of course it's not a really smooth journey for us. Like we also have uh, challenges that we need to overcome. So it's the first is about the structure itself. That when we build the, the application structure, when we try to migrate, we also still need to agree on certain part. Like hey, where is the folder for pages, and then for the uh, reusable component, where should we put it? And then when it comes to the reusable component, like which part that we would like to call it the the smart component or which part that we would like to call it a basic component because sometimes a, a smart component or like a specific component it shouldn't be called twice like let's say that this component is already like loading certain large epic uh, data and it's actually only meant to be used in 
one page. I mean, in once in this page. So some some people. I mean, it's it's not supposed to be load multiple times because it's not uh, it's not meant for that. And then it's also like the consideration when we see the old code, like should we refactor or should we just uh, ignore it and then we just know what is the specification, write a totally new code of it. And then about the SSR because. The, when we try to move everything into front end, we know that one main problem is about the uh, is Google, sorry, Google. Not, I mean not only Google, like basically crawl the crawl source. So yeah, I think if you you express with Next.js or Next.js sometimes, this might already uh, help to solve. But yeah, for us, because we come from Rails, I mean we come from, uh, we already have a backend. So it's basically like that's a challenge to build up the SSR in the middle of it. And then it's about the component management itself and then because people have different mindset of how to build a component so we need to uh, in a certain type of standard way to build it so uh, yeah uh, just if you're up for challenge so it's also like a company that we are actually hiring for the front end and back end developer so uh, yeah that's all from my side so thank you so much for the attention i would like to get any Questions or any opinions if you would like to share. Yeah. Yeah. Mark about the SSR. Yeah. Uh, not need the SSR as a tool because most crawlers don't have a lot of it. Oh, the Ajax thing. Yeah. 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 I just have a really basic question. When you're breaking stuff up in different components, like how small should a component be? How small? Right. <laughs> no, uh, I think it's when we try to make things as a component again because we we think of it as a, a reusability part. Like when we try to let's say we see the application, like, let's say this part, let's say that like, the GitHub icon, like if it's an icon, that like, uh, would we think about making use of it in other pages or other apps in the future? Because that's where we are considering to make it as a separate component. Else, when we know that actually this thing might only be used on this page, it's okay to just be, uh, hard code that, that part of the element on that page itself because it's not really meant to be used on other pages. Like the usability, I think it's the key. For bootstrapping an application, would you suggest using the component base or just do whatever it takes to just then refactor it later because you have no idea what components you want. Mm -hmm. Because if you start component based, then later you scrap a lot of your code. Mm -hmm. So would you say that start with component or with only refactor then you start with component? Mm -hmm. So I think yeah for that let's let's see if there is I mean it depends on the situation. If we actually already have a standard or let's say we already have a design that is made before usually like some companies or maybe like uh, there is also like already existing uh, frameworks out there like bootstrap there is actually a bootstrap view or there is like some of uh, available design system if we would like to make use of those design system as our standard then we don't really have to reinvent the wheel and we make use of, of them to bootstrap our application but if let's say that we just have our own app and we want to start it from scratch, I think thinking about component is more about thinking ahead. If we don't, I mean, but if actually thinking ahead takes a, a lot of plan and while we just want to bootstrap, I would say that just work with what, whatever that we have right now. Let's say it's just a landing page that we want to try out with some certain features. Uh, first, I would like, I think the one to consider is the framework. But do, do we need like such a framework like React or Vue to build it up? Or actually it's more about just jQuery will do because it's just me like just toggle the button up and down. So I, I really think that it's first is based on the complexity and based on the long term uh, maintaining that. Like how long we would like to keep doing this. Like if it's gonna be a long term then we should strap it properly from the start. Else we can just build something simple and then uh, Either throw it away or either we refactor it because we know that it's worth to continue. Okay. Sorry? 
Oh, ah, uh, the CSS in JS. Oh, you mean like the CSS is uh, uh, dynamic based on the JavaScript? I I think it sometimes it's necessary, especially when it comes to uh, interactivity. Where, but I mean, if you say I like it or not, I would say it based on the needs. So, like, for example, like, let's say we have a, a component that we would like to make some interaction on it. When we click on it, then it should move based on a certain position. Like sometimes it's a certain date, a number that we couldn't just retrieve from the CSS. Like we need to do some JavaScript calculation to know that it should move to this other uh, other way. That means yeah, we need to have this inline CSS that is built under that component. The inline CSS, I think, it's also actually something that is still reactive because in a component like. Uh, React or Vue, we can build like a certain style, and then inside there is actually an object. Let's say the left, the left is uh, the value of the left is a variable. The value of the right or top is a variable that we can declare by the JavaScript calculation. Depends on what we need. Maybe something that I think if let's say we try to make use of some, I mean it's just to make a mini game or something that it does need some calculation to handle the the styling. Then CSS in JS is something that we will, I mean, most likely we have to adapt. Yeah. Vue is more like a framework, while React is more like a library that you can choose. For the component, uh, do you allow, uh, I believe the uh, components is allowed to mess with the components. Uh, for example, in the patch, you will, you will see a lot of components nesting inside of uh, this yeah. component. Uh, do you have uh, a standard there or a suggestion? How many uh, components can be tested? Ah, the deep, the deep nesting, yeah. right? Uh, by standard, I mean we don't really have a term. I mean we don't really have a number of standard. But from what I remember, the stand, the standard or the most optimal deep is thirty two for the number of like let's say based right. on the HTML itself. We look at the HTML. It should not. I uh, mean it should be mostly optimized at thirty two layer. Uh, I read this from some other guy. Oh, from the architecture, do you have the limits like uh, import, for example, fetch component, then inside there, of course, you will have a, a few uh, dummy, mm. dummy components. Then inside the dummy component, do you allow like, dummy component or do you allow some container? Uh, okay, so I think for, for that, we, we first, we I mean, there is a base. For that first, the base is of course is a page itself. The page is like the most the parent, 
to add that font to everything. I mean, if we are looking at this as a layer of components, so the page, and then the second is the child. Usually, the child they will or I mean the child because. Uh, let's say like the canvas just now, we can call it like a smart component because it's not just a small simple canvas but it also has some functionality inside and it might also have some items that it wants to make use. So it depends that if we would like to put the, uh, the other component in the canvas itself, it's something that we are more like focusing on the canvas. So from the parent side, we only have actually two layers, which is the component, the, the parent, and those uh, smart component bases. While those smart component bases, they they have their own architecture, like what component that it want to use. But of course, that I mean, we don't really see the the. I mean, we don't really see how much deep it should have based on the parents only. But it's more about like based on the abstraction. Because from the parent, I just want to know that I want to use header, uh, side pane, and the canvas and the toolbar. That's all from the parent side. Well, the toolbar, how many things that he needs inside, it's based on the necessity. So it doesn't really matter for us about the deepness because I think it's also automatically defined from the uh, from the functionality itself. Like if it's just a toolbar, it needs like a certain buttons, and then some buttons are grouped. That means that there will be another nest of the group and then a button inside. And I think that's totally fine as well. Oh, the second question is that. Um Let's say you have a very deep nested uh, components that need to communicate maybe a few layers out of the um, what is your what is your uh, solution to, to, you know, to communicate? So by uh, I mean by the most general approach of it is a share share state, like a global state management. So we, we have like a one store or one State. Usually, I, mean, I think in the few X, sorry, in the React, you usually call it the Redux, the, the data management, which when when uh, every single component, it has to, uh, it depends. So first, we have to define what is the smart, which one is the smart component and which one is the basic component. A smart component means that it has a data or it has a application logic because uh, it needs to manage this data. So then he has the access to directly get the data into the uh, shared state. While the one that is inside, usually, if let's say that actually inside that smart component, there is some basic components like buttons. Those buttons component, they shouldn't know the real data of the, uh, of the state because they are just like a simple element. So they should be the one that is, I mean, is the parent or is the smart one that should fit the data to the child. So about like how deep this can be, usually it shouldn't be too, too, uh, too, too much. Because if let's say that actually this component, it has another component, it has another point, another component. I mean, it should actually see the case, the use case. How can this thing is so deep? Like let's say because he, this button, let's say the color is green, but then it's defined from the top or anything. We should see from the pattern first. Like if the toolbar is supposed to be green because the state is green, then it's the toolbar that decides the color is green. And then it passes on the child, and then it's passed on the child. Usually, I mean, it's based on the props. Usually, we call it the, the props data. Because we don't want the child, especially the basic component, is too smart. When it's too smart, we cannot reuse it anymore. So, what is the uh, Sorry? Ah. <laughs> um, so, you say you change the open. Did you change the open from NC to the current? Yeah. Like how long did you guys do it? And did you guys grow it on the step by step? Or did you guys grow it on the top of the step? Are you using that to make NC code? That's actually one of the questions that you need to do. Still, we want to make NC code. So, uh, let's see the first one to answer. So, I, I mean, the, the, the time that it takes for us, uh, uh, maybe before the time, I would say the scope. So, in our page, we, we I mean, the, the one that we that I present just now is the editor, which is the one that has the most complicacy. 
while the other pages is mostly about like showing the, the, the data, the user, uh, the account settings, the pricing page, those doesn't really have a lot of complex complexity to be built. So, well, I mean, when we try to prioritize which one, actually we prioritize the simpler first because we want to also learn. At that time that we are doing it, it's not like we are already master everything. So we, we learn from the simple one. And then after that, we start to, to build the, the largest one editor. It took us approximately, uh, I mean, for the small pages, that those are um, kind of done in three months. It's uh, three months, is, it's also like we try to split the, the work with uh, the team. I think we have, I mean, the backend also helped us that time, also learn view and work with that. So three months is to change all of our pages, except the editor. The editor is done in the middle of it because we want to also get some uh, practices. And for the editor itself, it took us around seven months. Did you guys grow up? Uh, the seven months, uh, it's more about the completion of the product. I mean, it's more about like the major, but when it comes to the testing, everything, yeah, it took another one to two months because uh, refactoring. I mean, if, if, if you guys have experience, it's not always comes uh, smooth. There's also some one two regression that has to be checked before we release. Do you still have jQuery? Yes. Uh, in some, there is one part that we have. Uh, just now, if you see the presentation, these are actually still built with jQuery. So one of the beauty, I would say, in in, in the current view architecture is that as long as we scope the the app inside a view component. And then we just define, let's say, because in jQuery it's more about like the initialization. Like we want to, when the element is rendered, then we want to add the listener, like jQuery, select this on this, like those are the old codes that we can still reuse as long as we put it on uh, on the mountain or in the React is the component div mount, right? So like after everything is rendered, then we will run the jQuery code inside that. But that will be that will also put the consequences that we should not modify the DOM from the read from the view anymore because those commands are already like polluted with the jQuery uh, initializations. So let's ask because I'm new to the process. Uh, do you face some thing, <laughs> some problems? Some problems like uh, when there's some plugin because view is not popular yet. Mm -hmm. So there's a plugin that we can't actually no, no, not, not much community. So you, know, you can't achieve something you want from the, uh, the plugin. So you guys uh, write your own plugin. Well, uh, yeah, I would say that uh, we do some plugins that we have. We actually prefer to to be ourselves for like a model or like a, a message, like a learn message. But uh, the one that we, I mean, if you say about like a third party plugin that was not really working, so far we haven't. Have we? Yeah. So basically there is one 
leader that holds these two things. This the oh. is the big boss. Mm -hmm. Right. Have you had any criticisms with regards to how Uh, I didn't really catch. All right, so in theory, as a couple, uh, because uh, we're not using functional components, right? Mm -hmm. That means for every component, the state, all the events, everything is coupled to the component. And there are um, a few issues with this. For example, when we have passive components and we're listening to events, for the parent to listen to a new passage of event, we need to keep submitting it to the parent. So that's a problem because now the events and these components are coupled. So that's one thing. And then also in every single component, they have their own state. And to communicate state between these things, you need, because it lacks something like a two-way data binding as a fast angular would have. Or there's no like the standardized way for you to make it to use the event bus. Do you have any criticisms as to how you handle these kind of things? Or do you think you was really meant to handle this bus application? Mm, if it's about the, the event, and especially when it comes to the uh, deep component that we want to handle from the side. So to me, it's first, yeah, I mean, it's the same thing that I would say it's based on how we pass the data from the parent that can be the system that was found. Because uh, let's say that we have a small image uh, like just an image, we want to listen to this image to it, as eventually the parent will listen. I mean, this image is something that I would say uh, the clip itself is the one that we want to come from the source, which is only the image that has the source of the clip. Uh, and then the parent is like the thumbnail. The thumbnail actually is make use of the uh, image. So then the thumbnail is the one that will listen to it and then goes up and then eventually it goes up. You see when the comma is too deep because the event is the source is inside that, it will become too much and yeah, that will create. I mean that I would say is actually to me it seems like the the base cons of having things is the component of time. I mean, if we would like to, to make use of the event bus or maybe like an event bus, but it's actually, it is possible, okay? But that will also, to me, it gives like a disconnect between the, the, the source of the app and then the, the, the back of the middle. Because it doesn't seem uh, as natural to me when, we, when the component is just supposed to listen to a click. But then because the parent is supposed to be the one to handle it, the parent doesn't know anything that the click has. Like if, because you just want to show card in. So I, I mean to me it's more like the consequences that we see if we would like to see the, the pattern close properly. But again, if we see that as a hassle, I think in, in the end like, it could be like we try to think, okay, then just make the image as a smart component. Something like that. Because we don't want to make the hassle of too much, then if this image is too much, then we just wrap it under a smart component that is meant for passing the, the event to the top, let's say by let's say by the, passing it to the state to the main data. Because that's where it still makes sense that this smart component that holds this one part is the one that we know is responsible for keeping it up. Rather than the basic one is the one that getting it up. I think to me it's again it's based on how we would like to retain the principle that we have to to make the the flow make sense. Thing that to me is, is that there is no it's like there is no perfect pattern for for this one but i think again if if it's a because i mean why we control about this is about the team right like let's say if it's i mean if it's just working on our own we can just 
to ourselves that we don't have to worry or maybe we're just like complaining in our own mind but if it's a team effort then it's something that we can discuss as a team and then decide together like what makes sense and what is the most reasonable uh, approach that we would like to gather because when one person is doing this certain thing it's something that the other teammates most likely will copy because they thought this is the standard so rather than seeing if other like copying like it's better to have it like as a base example that is already this, uh, agree with the team and then try to make it as uh, another standard for the team so thank you building the static and dynamic apps using Gatsby. Uh, has anyone heard about Gatsby yet? Oh, nice. <laughs> so, who am I? I'm Ismail. Uh, I'm also known as Smartwash. I'm uh, a work as a frontend developer at Hobbit uh, with an amazing team of talented people. I also work on site projects like AI hashtags, which is a mobile Android and iOS app that generates hashtags. Yeah. The landing page is built with the Gatsby. Everything is on a markdown file, and I simply edit the markdown file and automatically generates the content. Uh, I also built uh, another site project called Beef, which is uh, a Gatsby landing page, a Creatrix app, app and the recipe app. It's only in beta and uh, it's, it has almost uh, 50 users, but uh, zero active users. <laughs> it's simply for uh, decision. For example, if you want to, to make a decision, you ask the community to help you make a decision. And uh, later on, you can track, uh, for example, for example, here it's the GitHub information, how it was and uh, how it became. And uh, you can track your decisions afterward. And I publish my articles at my personal blog, it's mapush.com, and uh, it's also built with GitVGS. And, uh, and uh, I contribute to open source, I contributed to GitVGS when it was the first full launch. I made uh, some uh, source plugins and uh, I contributed to making the starters. I have lots of GitV starters. And uh, I created the CSS framework called the uh, name. It has uh, 200 stars in GitHub. Uh, as a web developer who wants to make uh, a static or dynamic uh, web app, you're surrounded by so many tools and uh, resources and communities. You have Angular, React, uh, TypeScript, a lot. But all these tools have to use HTML, CSS, and JavaScript because your app will run on the browser. But what if you are a React developer? You might think that you will just run CreateX app and the name of your app and that's it and you will roll and run. But the truth is, uh, unfortunately, that's not the case. The truth is, you will end up with these three choices. CreateX app, and uh, Next.js and uh, GetSpeed.js. These are the main uh, important three choices we have to make. So let's see what uh, each choice offers. Creative app offers uh, client-side rendering, meaning that you're, uh, when you browse a page, the, the browser renders uh, the content and not the server. 
Next.js offers the server-side rendering, which is slow and uh, takes a lot of time. And uh, GitHub.js brought something new called pre-rendering, meaning server-side rendering during the run and build time. And uh, it's really efficient. So what is GitHub? Uh, GitHub is a new static seed generator, like uh, if you use uh, jQuery or uh, Go. Uh, what is called the, the other one that is based on Go? I forgot his name. Uh, anyway, it's uh, built with React, Webpack, and GraphQL. It creates uh, hybrid websites. Think of it as a mixture of uh, a React app and uh, a static uh, website. It generates uh, files during the run and build time. It navigates between pages with the push state, just like a single page app, but it is using a rich return under, under the hood. So, what's awesome about it? First of all, you can build both static and dynamic apps. You can use different uh, data sources or file formats to manage content, like uh, WordPress uh, content. You can, you can have the client uh, publish and edit the content on WordPress and everything can be rendered on the website and uh, it implements uh, different services you can implement different services easily by installing the GitHub plugins like authentication, search, payment, etc. So the pros and cons the pros are it's secure because it's static uh, but not applicable for dynamic apps it is cash up, it is cheap to host, even free using Netlify. Uh, it's out of the box, uh, good performance, progressive web app, and uh, best practices. It loads uh, as, they, as their uh, logo, blaze it fast, and uh, single page app localized. And it has a magnific uh, hot reload. Uh, the cons are it does not generate new files on the one, meaning that uh, it doesn't do server-side rendering. But uh, as of now, uh, it's not important as uh, Google and other crawlers can crawl JavaScript now. There is the, the single page app. Uh, the one I showed you before, it's a, it's a single page app. And uh, as you can see here, Google has managed to crawl every post and every profile. Here. These are crawled by the Google bot. So how gets we render the content? How does that uh, pre-rendering work? First of all, it opens and validates a, a file called gitsby config. Then it loads uh, any installed plugins and delete the previous uh, build files. And then it gets the contents if there is any from your files or uh, platforms such as contents for or WordPress. And uh, it extracts and runs the GraphQL queries uh, and, and generates necessary pages. If uh, you implement that logic on the, a file called the uh, mod. So I mentioned that there are like GraphQL queries. There are two types of queries. There are page and static uh, queries. So what is the difference? So GitHub has uh, three types of uh, components. There, there are templates, pages, and components. So basically, page queries do accept uh, variables, meaning they are dynamic and uh, can can be added only on uh, page components, but. Uh, static queries are static, meaning that they don't accept any variables, and they do and um, can be used on components or uh, pages and templates. So, what are Gatsby plugins? There are three types of Gatsby plugins. There is the source plugin, which means that it adds external content to your Gatsby site, like uh, from your CMS or uh, file format, or uh, you can query a REST API while building the website, so the whole content from your database will be rendered uh, statically. And there are transformers, meaning that you can have uh, one YAML file and uh, it has everything uh, on your website and it transforms the YAML file into HTML files. And there are services that can be easily implemented, like uh, Google Analytics, Mixpanel, Century, Algolia, etc. 
It is used by most of popular corporations like Figma, IBM, Airbnb, Nike, Syndicate, and Ghost. And uh, Ghost uh, is using uh, this BGS under the hood of their CMS. So I have two demos. The first demo is building a blog with the Markdown files. I will show it to you. So here is where I write my normal uh, posts. They are marked down. You can uh, specify here any variables that you want. And then you have to install two plugins, the transformer that will transform your markdown files to HTML files, and the other which simply create uh, pages based on those uh, markdown files. And here is where we can create uh, the pages. So let me zoom in. It is visible, right? Yeah. So Gatsby offers uh, this API called uh, Create Pages, which uh, which will create pages. For example, here I'm calling the template post and uh, I'm querying uh, using GraphQL and I'm, querying, I'm sending this query to to fetch all the, the markdown files, which are right here. This is the first article and the second one. And I'm only fetching the slide. Why? Because I want to create the page based on that slide. And here is our post template. Here is our page query. As you can see here, it accepts a variable of, of the slide. And whenever the user navigates to that specific article, you will see the, the content based on that slide. Let me show you the, the blog directly. It is open source and you can clone it if you want. So, as you can see, it's really fast because it's static. And uh, let's move on to the next demo. The next demo is building a uh, not to do app because everyone is building to do app, so I thought why not build a not to do app with the Gatsby? It's connected to a REST API. I built it just uh, this morning. So let me show you first uh, how it works. So I will start my database, it's a MongoDB database, and I will start my REST API. And then I will start the, the, the Gatsby app. And it takes some time to, to build. Uh, that is one of the cons of Gatsby DS. Here is it. So this is, uh, this is a static page, but when you navigate to, to this page, this is a map. You can uh, register or log in, and uh, it does everything you might think of. So let's log in. Simply not to do app, you can add a new task, for example, let's be optimized. And you can navigate to that uh, task, you can set it to done, or you can delete it. If I refresh, everything is coming from the REST API. So, normally this, uh, this will be built using uh, CreateRx app. Yeah, uh, has any, is any one of you a React developer? Yeah, normally we use the CreateRx app or for something like React to app to build the such app, yeah. And uh, let me show you the source code. So you might think that I'm using Redux, or but I'm not using Redux. I'm using just React, basically, uh, because with the React hooks it offers uh, everything you need without Redux. So here I'm wrapping the, uh, the whole app 
with the my provider. Let me show you my provider. Here yeah, I'm calling the React Context API. Okay. And uh, I'm calling a custom read user. It's, it's simply a JavaScript function. Let me show it to you. There are two read users, one for the tasks and one for the user. And this is my... Uh, and here I'm, I'm using the watch queues read user. I'm passing that to the read user and uh, I'm deconstructing that array, taking tasks from this batch. You can name this uh, variable however you want. It simply dispatches actions like Redux does. And uh, I pass everything within this uh, consumer. Because Redux uh, has, uh, has uh, built a new hook called use context, you can easily get the content, uh, for example. For example, here is my login form. I'm, uh, I'm getting that uh, content using use context. Ah, you need to zoom. Can you see now? Yeah. So I'm using the, the React of use context to fetch the content of, from my context. As you can see here, it's a functional component, it's not a class component. I'm using use state for submission. I'm, I'm using, I'm storing everything within this object. It has username, email, password. Normally, you will use something like the Redux forms or forming, but I'm using plain React. And uh, here is where I, I send my action here. Normally, if you are using uh, Redux, you will you will send your action and you will handle everything on that action. But uh, here, I'm sending all, I'm dispatching only uh, the action to the read user, and then I'm, I'm ma managing the rest within my component. I don't need to to manage your global state. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, sure. As you can see here, I have only three pages. The landing page, the app, and the forum and report. So, you might think, uh, what happens when Gatsby builds the sites? Uh, does it generate pages for each route, or it does not? But we can handle that on, on Gatsby now. So here I'm telling Gatsby to generate a page for each route that matches this, uh, this path. And if I, went, if I go back to, to my example, and I hit the 400 for the view. As you can see here, it's, it's only up, but the crawler can crawl the, the other pages. Yes, if you have some questions or anything. Yeah. Um, so, what's the relationship between Gatsby and React? Yeah, uh, Gatsby is built with, it, with the React. So, you see React syntax and Gatsby? No, but you can. But you need to start with React. Sorry? How much is the website to say that you can reference the data source of the US? Fetching data from WordPress? You can get data from any APIs. Yeah, uh, if you want, I can show you an example of getting the data from content. Yes?
consensus is the best uh, CMS that uses the uh, GraphQL API. I have used many, and seriously, consensus is, is the best. And can you view the website? Uh, yeah, this, uh, the landing page is Gatsby, but uh, the app is the Creative app. I'm still migrating to Gatsby. Yeah. It's fast. Gatsby is fast, yeah. Hmm? Yeah, everything is on a clipper. So, for example, here I have, let me see, yeah, sorry for the, the language, yeah, okay. So, I have here the, the models, for example, author, blog, topic, and think of it as models in, in VC design pattern. And here I have the content, when you want to create a new entry, you select the type of the model and you start editing the content. This is really easy to use for the client. But for you, you will have to, to install a Contentful Gatsby plugin that will fetch the data from Contentful and build, and build your website. Let me see if I have some example here. Sorry, so what is Contentful? Like a database? It's a CMS. Yeah, Content it's management CMS. system. It's like WordPress, but it's headless CMS. Headless. Yeah. Ah, Yeah, let me pull uh, an example to show you. Yeah, so to link choose channels. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's so, awesome. so, so, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, I have two articles on content, one in Arabic and one in Chinese. And uh, I'm creating two pages for each version. Yeah, it's and this one is Arabic. Let me see if I can find the content here. Yeah, I have it on another account. Yeah, any other questions? Sorry? Uh, you want to see the bit files? Ah, sure. Everything is uh, inside the... Yeah. Yes. It's a single page up yeah. yeah, everything is uh, minified within this point. But so this is the generated site right now. What about the, the build itself? Like, how are you getting the data and how are you passing to render? Can, can, I, can you show us step by step how you generate the static site? Ah, yeah, sure. Uh, you mean how you create a website from scratch, from the start? Even right now, what, what would you normally do? Let's say you change something and then why do you, why do you arrive? Yeah. yeah, let me post a, a new article, for example. 
For example, here I will create a new article. So I have created a new article and I will start my server. So you add, add a file? Yeah. And then you... Yeah, stop. Build the whole thing? Yeah. Because it's that big? Yeah. That's fair and then you have to redeploy each time. Alright. Well, but the one with the content pool is it depends if your if your app is static or dynamic. If it's you dynamic, can... you don't have to redeploy yet. But if it's static, you will have to redeploy each time. Here, here is the side article. Yes, so Gitsby has an internal uh, GraphQL API. Internal GraphQL API, yeah. query files? Yeah, that's kind of query files. Yeah. Oh. Uh, let me show you the idea. Oh, you can stop. <laughs> okay, just, just <laughs> <laughs> Here is the GraphQL idea. For example, if I want to query all my articles, I can use the all markdown remark. It is not title. It's it's uh, it also adds some uh, core features like uh, time to read, like uh, the date. Yeah. Yeah. Any, any query content. Sorry. Any query Yeah. It's it's as if it. Okay. Do you know how it works? Uh, like, is there a GraphQL server? It has oh, it's using Mongo, right? Sorry? It's using MongoDB, you No, it's uh, on my example, the dynamic app, it is using MongoDB, but here it's it's a non internal GraphQL API. It's a, it's a GraphQL API. Just Markdown. Just Markdown files, yeah. There is no database. I mean, so you see, you see GraphQL, are you running a GraphQL server and is no, it no. using a or do they just have a GraphQL syntax compatible? Yes, yeah, so when you build your website, it creates nodes. Sorry? It creates nodes. The nodes. The GraphQL nodes, yeah. Okay. And uh, you have here the docs if you want to see all the, the, pro the provided the mutation queries. How do you Any other questions? Is the dynamic one also? Uh, in the past, not uh, as of today. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let me show you an example in real time, for example. So, this is a single page app, and I will navigate to this post. Uh, normally, it won't, it won't be crawled by any crawler, but let me, let me try to share it on Slack, for example. So 
you can see it's managed to crawl it. Yeah. For this case, that's not because this post is already uh, generated. There is a static. No, no, th this is a single page app. Yeah. yeah. It's not Git, but it's a clear trick app. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, Slack, Telegram, and Google can now crawl JavaScript, but LinkedIn uh, is not yet there. Yeah. Uh, how, how do you compare this to uh, the Sorry? How do you compare this to the next Next.js? Yeah, Next.js does uh, full server side render. And because now the crawlers can crawl JavaScript, so why, why waste time going to learn Next.js when you can simply use CreateX app or P2.js? Yeah, that's a point. So you were saying that React is all Sorry, can, can you raise your voice? A lot of people can use React. Yeah, it's possible. Yeah, but it's complicated. And Next.js, Next.js is uh, is using uh, React as well. In the go. I'll give you some use cases when when to use uh, Next.js and when to use Get.js. For example, uh, e-commerce, blog, uh, landing pages, documentation are good uh, use cases for Get.js. But if you are uh, trying to build like a social media network or a learning platform like Udemy or Udacity, it's better to use uh, Next.js. Uh, let me show you uh, a large app we, we are working on at work. It's a learning uh, platform, in, uh, fully in Arabic. So, for example, these these tracks are uh, static, but when uh, but the progress uh, you can see here, the progress and some some data is dynamic. But the, the order stuff are static, so the users can uh, at least uh, see the, uh, the first uh, content. Yeah. Yeah. So the progress bar won't be inside the static bounds, or it will be inside the static bounds. Uh, if if you go offline, mm -hmm. uh, the progress will be logged in forever. Yeah. And uh, it's uh, a progressive web app, so you can open it uh, as a window. Any other questions? So I will uh, make my repositories public so that you can go ahead and so it's uh, the first thing is the recipe I if you want it, it's a startup pack. You can easily modify it if you want. I I, I wrote a nice documentation if you want to use it. I will open source it now. And 
the, the, the GitHub app if you want it. I will open source it as well. It's, it's very well documented as well. Uh, yeah, I forgot to, you, to tell you that uh, even, even the slides are built with the SVGS. And let me show you how I, I, I prepare my slides. As you can see, it's, a, it's one single markdown file. It's, uh, it's not Markdown, it's MDX. Uh, React inside Markdown. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so this is, for example, this is a slide. This is the second one, this is the third one, this is your. You can easily add animations, uh, change the colors, everything. For example, here it's inverted, so it's the background is white and the color is black. And this is the future of uh, Gitsby with the Gitsby teams. Teams they are coming soon, so that uh, you can uh, get right of styling and templating in the Markdown file and just focus on building your app. It's called the uh, MTX deck. Yeah. yeah, you need to browser. Yeah, it's it's, to, it's the same one uh, used in uh, React conference. Yeah, they are using the same technology. Hmm? Sorry? Uh, it's called the uh, MTX deck. MTX deck. Yeah, let me show it to you. Yeah, this one. Even their landing page is. <laughs> It's really easy to get started. I will open source my decks so you can clone it and change if you want. And uh, the block I showed you, I, I built it on my previous talk in uh, five minutes, in live coding session, in five minutes. Uh, if you remember when uh, Rails uh, started, the, the creator of Rails, uh, he showcased the building of blog in like uh, 15 minutes, I guess, or 10, right? 10 or 15. So I tried to do the same with JavaScript. So it was it took me only five minutes. And uh, if if you use the like uh, Git or Starter, it can it can you can build the blog in like uh, one minute or two. Yeah, you can take notes if you want to do links and everything is on the GitHub. Yeah, yeah. Thank you.
So I think we don't have time for tech tips. Understand? Um, any speaker for next month? Anyone want to reserve a slot for next month? No. Okay. Um, shout outs. Any shout outs? So watch here. So um, tech ladies will be starting a chapter here in Penang starting this month. So, um, so they are Singapore based. The founder will be here on May 25th. Um, there will be one person in charge in Penang. So starting a tech ladies group here. Um, the tickets is here. You can register yourself. Uh, it's hosted in NACAC. So it opens to everyone. The public can come and join. <laughs> this time, this time, hopefully have no girls. Uh, hopefully have no girls. Uh, not like now, uh. <laughs> So right, okay. Uh, uh, any more shoutouts? Any hirings? Shoutouts. Okay. Uh, last note. So later, I need to take attendance, uh, and also. So if you want to help out on any meetups, tech meetups in Penang, we have a lot of tech meetups in Penang right now. So if you want to help out on any of it, um, talk to me because I know most of the organizer. Um, and thank you for being here. See you in the next meetup. Thank you.